Welcome to Module 4 of the AND VSA Statewide Primary Prevention Orientation. During this module, we will discuss the importance of community collaboration and community coalitions in eliminating domestic and sexual violence. This module will highlight how these partnerships and coalitions allow us to effectively work across the social ecology, incorporate effective prevention principles, and create the most impact on the local level. This module will walk through various approaches and steps we can take to establish a shared understanding and vision, build strong partners, and pool resources and expertise. During this module, we will address the importance of mobilizing our communities. We will open by introducing the PIES framework, which provides structure for many aspects of primary prevention. Then, we will go over the seven steps to community mobilization. And finally, we will highlight how we can develop effective partnerships and then end by going over different characteristics that we can employ to ensure the success of our coalition's efforts. But before we get into all that, let's talk about why it's beneficial to get our community involved in DVSA prevention. Eliminating violence is not a task that prevention staff can accomplish alone. We need other organizations and fellow community members to help us out by getting involved. Community mobilization is the process of empowering and engaging communities to make positive social change locally. Often, many of our community partners share the same objectives to reduce risk factors and build protective factors of individuals, influencers, or in communities. So, we can see that it is very important to have our community involved with prevention work. Now, let's take a look at some frameworks that we can utilize to get community members engaged. PIES is a simple framework which can be utilized to think about working on a variety of topics, but has been frequently used to guide prevention coalitions processes and prevention capacity building among Alaska's Delta sites. PIES stands for Planning, Implementation, Evaluation, and Stability. We can think about this framework in terms of the process of making a pie. The planning process is not unlike thinking about a recipe and all of the ingredients and steps involved in making that pie. And the implementation process is like when we put all of the ingredients together and bake our pie. The evaluation process is like tasting our pie and deciding whether or not we like it. And then sustainability could take shape in writing down the recipe, adapting it based on how it tasted, putting it in a safe place, or sharing it with family members. These are the four core steps to any prevention effort, whether it's a program which addresses root causes of violence, the creation of a local prevention coalition, or the development of a plan that illustrates strategies to eliminate violence in a community. We will take a deeper look into how PIES figures into the community mobilization process in a little while. When it comes to mobilizing our community, we can break down the steps of PIES a little more into seven specific steps. These steps guide the process for coming together as a community, planning for prevention, and implementing that plan. Through this process, our community will be able to develop a solution to the problems of domestic violence, sexual assault, and teen dating violence that fits in with our own local context socially, historically, and culturally. This process breaks down the PIES framework into more concrete, manageable pieces. First, the foundation of the community mobilization process rests on strong partnerships. If we have a group of dedicated individuals and organizations, we can create a vision that is representative of the multiple perspectives present in our community. We can plan, implement, evaluate, and sustain these efforts together. Sometimes, you will hear communities working on prevention discuss their coordinated community response, otherwise known as CCRs or prevention coalitions. Coalitions can look different from community to community. They could be comprised informally of a group of concerned citizens, or they could largely have participation from organizations and institutions which have a stake in the issue of eliminating domestic violence and sexual assault from our communities. These might include representatives from local health care, law enforcement, schools, faith-based institutions, and youth programs. Members will represent a broad range of interests and perspectives so that we can ensure that the community's approach to preventing domestic and sexual violence is comprehensive. So, if your community does not have an obvious body that can serve as this prevention coalition, then the first step is to begin to identify and recruit stakeholders. As prevention staff, we have an important role in the coalition, but it can be tricky. Because we have an understanding of prevention, we might assume that we would make many of the decisions within the coalition. 
However, this is not often the case. Unless we have an external facilitator, our role is to convene the coalition, to share the latest information, and often to facilitate and to build prevention capacity. Our knowledge puts us in the position of educating and guiding our coalition's discussions. At the beginning, we may be the person that identifies or recruits partners to bring to the table to discuss primary prevention. Because this process may outline whole community needs, it is essential to establish significant opportunities for coalition member participation, engagement, and buy-in. This often requires a constant reassessment of our own support and leadership within the group. As with all public health concerns, each step will require high levels of collaboration. We rely on the cooperation of community and state partners to effectively prevent violence. In the case of domestic, teen dating, and sexual violence, DVSA prevention and response advocates, health practitioners, youth organizations, behavioral health organizations, and others must work together in order to understand the full spectrum of the issues that a community is facing. While you may be compiling the information with a specific lens, schools, other local partners, the Department of Education and Early Development, the Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, and the network have all compiled resources so that you may not have to recreate the wheel. The next topic for discussion for our coalition should be around assessing our community. One way to understand the factors at play in our community as they relate to violence is by doing a needs assessment. A needs assessment usually takes written form and is a compilation of a number of things. It describes the geographic, demographic, and economic location. It gives an overview of the prevalence of victimization and perpetration, and it outlines community protective factors, resources, and strengths. It also identifies risk factors for domestic and sexual violence and barriers to health and safety. Several communities in Alaska have conducted needs assessments for their IPV prevention plans. These plans are available on the ANDVSA website and also in the companion materials on the Canvas site. Part of the needs assessment process will involve a discussion of the underlying conditions of violence. This is when we will talk about how domestic and sexual violence has manifested in our community and what the structural and social determinants of health and safety are. This means that we need to understand the who, what, where, when, and how of specific community concerns. For example, our community may be having issues with a large number of cases of intimate partner violence, but what is the nature of that violence? Is the perpetration and victimization represented evenly across the community? Is it occurring in specific generations or segments of the community? What else do we know about the issue? What systemic, historical, and contextual issues are shaping these outcomes? We also want to understand and address what risk and protective factors are present in our community. You may have already thought about which of those factors are of particular importance in your community in Module 3. It is important that we have a good understanding of what these are so that we can develop a response that fits into the context of our community's needs. The research on risk and protective factors may indicate a connection between the presence of several risk and protective factors and the presence of certain behaviors or conditions that perpetuate violence. It is also important to consider how systems and public policies provide advantages and barriers for particular populations by increasing risk factors or protective factors for certain groups or communities. The World Health Organization says that this unequal distribution of health-damaging experiences is not in any sense a natural phenomenon, but is the result of a toxic combination of poor social policies, unfair economic arrangements, and bad politics where the already well-off and healthy become even richer, and the poor who are already more likely to be ill become even poorer. The research is just emerging on how the intersections of gender, disability, race, class, history, and public policy continue to impact or perpetuate conditions of health, safety, and violence. Next comes the planning process. We as prevention staff, as well as partners who have an interest in eliminating violence, must spend a great deal of time up front thinking critically about violence in our community and how we can address it in a manner that complements our community's strengths, the vision of our prevention coalition, and our prevention priorities within our organization. After we have a strong understanding of violence and the other important factors and characteristics in our community, it's time to develop our primary prevention plan. 
The prevention plan is the document that demonstrates the steps that our coalition and partners take in order to address the risk factors and promote protective factors present in our community, and also illustrates our collective vision for our community. We will discuss this topic further in Module 5. Next, we need to start thinking about evaluating our prevention efforts. As we think about the planning process and the change that we would like to see in our community, we should also be thinking about our evaluation plan. During this process, we will begin to establish more in depth how we will measure our progress. It is important to make sure that we do this before we begin implementing our prevention plan so that we can actually measure success and change. This means that we will plan out how we will collect data on the process of implementing our prevention plan, as well as the outcome of what happened after the plan had been implemented. We will go over evaluation in depth in Module 7. Now that we have our plans all figured out, it's time to implement them. Each community needs to determine its own methods for implementation based on its own specific strengths, weaknesses, and qualities, but it is important to clarify structures for implementation and reporting back. This may include subcommittees or specific organizations taking part of this work to move the work forward, to assist with evaluation, and updating progress for the group. Once we have implemented our strategies, we need to put our evaluation plan into action. When we implement our evaluation plan, we will be assessing whether or not our strategies did what we set out to accomplish and see if our plan was implemented as intended. Are we closer now to our new reality than we were before? Was our plan implemented like we thought it would be? What could we change for the future to ensure better results? We should look to our action plan and use the measurements and targets throughout the evaluation process. Lastly, we need to consider how we are going to sustain our work. Often, when people think of sustainability, they think of funding. However, the concept of sustainability includes much more, such as leadership, ownership, success or positive outcomes, resources, trained staff, and other components. It is important to consider sustainability throughout our process. We want to make sure that when we are in the planning stages, we consider if a strategy or approach will be sustainable. We also think about this during the implementation phase to determine that we are setting up implementation structures that can be sustained. We think about this during evaluation, too, to determine if the strategy or approach is something that we want to sustain. There are several core concepts within sustainability, and the process doesn't stop once we have done our evaluations. The seven steps are a cycle. We can take what we have learned and use it to inform our work in the future. So once we have completed our evaluations, we should go back to the beginning and reassess everything so that we can continuously improve our coalition, our plans, and the implementation process. Now let's see how these steps fit into the PIES framework. Before anything happens, we need to assemble our stakeholders into a prevention coalition. Then, as we begin the planning process, we will assess our community and examine the underlying conditions and risk and protective factors present. After that, we and our partners should devise a couple of plans. One to determine how we plan to prevent domestic and sexual violence locally, and one to evaluate that plan and any efforts that develop from that prevention plan. Then comes time to put our prevention strategies into action. And after our first implementation, we'll put that evaluation plan to use and examine what we did well and what we could do better. And finally, we'll use that data to improve our efforts for the next time around and work to find other solutions to make our strategy sustainable. You can use either PIES or the seven steps as you approach community mobilization, whatever makes the most sense for you and your partners. Moving on, let's talk about the first step in the community mobilization process, coalition building. Coalition building might seem like a natural thing to do, but it does require intentional thought and work to build a strong coalition. You can find many resources available about coalition building for prevention or community change online or in the companion materials, but for right now, we'll break this concept down a little bit more. Our coalition members are integral to the success of primary prevention efforts in our communities. We know that together, our coalition creates a plan for our community to eliminate violence, but before we even get to that stage, how do we form a coalition that will operate efficiently and effectively? 
When we recruit and gather stakeholders to be part of our coalition, we should build in a set of characteristics that will help us be successful in the long run. Before we do anything else, our first priority is to gather our partners together. We might already have some people in mind based on whom we've worked with in the past, but chances are we would like to get some more people on board. Who should be at the table to discuss DVSA prevention? This will likely depend on your community's dynamics, but some common members of coalitions around Alaska include DVSA shelters, public and behavioral health, law enforcement, school districts and colleges, youth or community centers, and tribal organizations. However, we should not limit our membership strictly to this list because as we begin to form our local prevention coalition, we should make a concerted effort to have our membership be inclusive, not exclusive. It is ideal for us to have a broad range of interests and perspectives from multiple sectors participate in the process, and yet we want to make sure that the group functions effectively. We will need to move beyond the organizations we are accustomed to work with and include broader participation. Sometimes parents or businesses might be interested in participating and might have an important perspective to contribute. All right, so now we have identified all of the people that we need to be at the table. Now it's time to think about how we should organize them within our coalition. Let's first consider our leadership structure. Strong leadership can make or break our coalition because they not only guide the actions of the coalition, but they also help to engage and inspire our membership to carry out our coalition's goals. Our leadership structure should be clearly defined so that everyone involved knows whom to approach for what. When considering who we want to serve as leaders within our coalition, what sorts of qualities should we look out for? There are typical qualities that leaders of any group should possess, such as strong communication skills, the ability to motivate others, trust in their fellow members, and conflict resolution skills. But also, prevention work requires strong partnerships with community members and partner organizations, so those who have a large network and good relationships with others in the community would be well suited for leadership in the coalition. Our leaders are also responsible for creating an inclusive atmosphere which we identified as the mark of a strong prevention coalition earlier. So, those who feel comfortable in welcoming and engaging others will do our coalition a great deal of credit. In addition to identifying leaders, we all will want to consider others who will help our coalition run smoothly from within and help us be more successful as we approach our community. As prevention staff, we have already determined that we will have the role as the facilitator. What are our other needs as a coalition? We will need someone to handle communications, another to handle our financial resources, and maybe another person to work on follow-up with partners. We could look within our coalition for individuals to take on these roles, or we may consider reaching out to find some volunteers to help us out. Another option to consider is to reach out to a consultant with a specific skill set to work on more technical aspects of our operations, such as grant writing or evaluation. Finding common ground is also an important piece of a great coalition. Reaching consensus will help our coalition to be efficient. The first thing that we will need to reach a common ground on is defining our mission and goals. If we have a group that is representative of all perspectives in our community, we will certainly have different ideas about what violence prevention might look like. Together, we should discuss all of those perspectives and synthesize them into a common mission and goals that we all feel comfortable pursuing. Also, when we bring together a diverse group of people, we must accept that we will all not be able to agree all of the time. So, when it comes to deciding the coalition's course of action, we need to have a process in place which will help us democratically determine how to proceed. This way, we are acknowledging all points of view and not leaving anyone out. Additionally, we should consider how we plan to resolve conflicts. While conflicts can be detrimental to our group's operations, if we address it, the effect is only temporary. If our membership agrees that we should address areas of conflict and disagreement, we can gain perspective and learn from it. One of the most important functions of our coalition is creating a primary prevention plan for local use. That said, we should look into how we can structure planning time in a systematic way that gives us enough time to plan effectively. Our planning needs may change as time passes. For example, 
Planning will likely be much more intensive in the early stages of our coalition because we will be devising our community prevention plan. Planning doesn't stop once we have created our prevention plan because it is a living document and it is subject to change as our community changes. However, our planning will evolve once that first plan has been created because we can refer to it to inform and adapt subsequent plans. Planning may be around specific strategies or evaluation, or planning may take place in several work groups. Our original planning group may want to consider progress every quarter or six months going over evaluations, successes, areas for improvement and growth, and addressing sustainability, and consider the implications for our plans. When we plan, how do we make sure that we are planning for results? Creating social change in a community can be a daunting task if we are considering the big picture. If we think about prevention that way, we risk taking on too much responsibility and burning out our members. The more detail-oriented members of our coalition might be able to give us some insight as to how we can break up our one big task into several smaller, more manageable tasks. This way, we can set ourselves up for success by building in small victories, which will boost the confidence and enthusiasm of coalition members, and also show to our community that we are making a difference. Another component of our coalition's operations should be to plan out how to communicate with others outside of our collaborative. Ideally, we want to get the word out on what we as a coalition are doing on a regular basis, so we should figure out the most effective way to communicate to the different audiences that we might work with. We will want to give some thought to what our collective message is and how we can use it to inspire participation. Also, the medium we use to communicate with our audience may vary depending on the social dynamics of our community. Some community members might respond well to a monthly newsletter, while youth we work with might be more inclined to catch up with the coalition's progress via social media. Local government officials that we work with might do well with an email with the minutes of each meeting attached. We should get a sense of what medium works for whom and update others regularly. Beyond planning for the future of prevention efforts in our community, we should set aside some time to examine our coalition and assess our strengths and weaknesses. We might find that most aspects of our coalition are running smoothly, but yet we are still struggling to get all of the people to the table that we feel should be there. But in short, the people that we do bring to the table are going to drive us towards success. By bringing together multiple disciplines, strong leaders, and varied skill sets, and getting them to work toward a common goal, we have a greater chance of not only developing successful prevention efforts that promote respect, but also collectively ending violence. And that's what it takes to piece together a great DVSA prevention coalition. If you are more interested in the components of highly functional collaboratives, please refer to the Module 4 companion materials. This concludes Module 4 of the ANDVSA Statewide Primary Prevention Orientation. Next up in Module 5, we will see how we can work together as a coalition to develop a primary prevention plan to eliminate violence in our community.